delicious. Human beings have this really bad habit of only focusing on the negatives. When you watch the news, the stories that stick out are inevitably the tragic ones, despite how little they actually affect you. When you work retail, all it takes is that one bad customer to shoot your whole day down the toilet, despite how many good ones there were otherwise. And when looking back at 2017, it's easy to think this was another terrible year full of political drama, dumb decisions, and all that other fun stuff. Unless you were an early investor in Bitcoin, chances are you're not looking back fondly at the past 12 months. Or maybe it's because you like video games. 2017 is being called the year of the loot box for the gaming industry, but it really shouldn't. When you break it down, there weren't actually that many games trying to get more money out of their customers by introducing gambling to their reward system. It's just the few that did were so high profile that at times it seemed like nothing else was going on. Meanwhile, everyone else was having a field day with 2017. Remember those single-player campaigns that any two-bit executive will tell you are going out of vogue? From mobile to mainstream, they were firing on all cylinders this year, with modern masterpieces like Nier Automata, Persona 5, Neo, Monument Valley 2, and so much more. Indie games especially were rocking that front. Players got a taste of macabre mystery in the sexy brutal. The long-awaited Cuphead finally dropped and became an incredible success story for Studio MDHR. Titles like The Mummy Demastered rounded out this action-packed catalog with even more high-octane platforming, and the less you know about Doki Doki Literature Club going into it, the better. Oh, and how do you feel about an open-world RPG based on golf? I love video games. 2017 was also really big on comebacks. Month after month, the Crash and Sane trilogy dominated sales charts. It's not hard to see why. It's the same reason Cadicorous does so well. People have a lot of nostalgia for the PS1, and it's been a largely untapped market up to this point. Not to mention these games were updated in so many meaningful ways to make them actually playable by modern standards, and people responded. This collection sold so well that Medieval is currently in the process of getting the same treatment. It's proof positive of what Shovel Knight showed us almost four years ago now, that good game design is truly timeless. Of course, some good old-fashioned retro never hurts either, which is why we also got the Disney Afternoon Collection. Do you want to play a collector's game from the NES that is otherwise horribly expensive on a modern platform that comes bundled with five other bona fide classics for only 15 bucks? Well, Capcom's got you covered. Even Bubsy released his best game ever this year, for what it's worth. But out of everyone that made this one of the best years ever for video games, nobody was owning it like Nintendo. If 2017 was the year of anything, it was the Switch. Public perception is very hard to change once it leans to one side, but somehow, Nintendo did it. They opened up strong with Breath of the Wild, which completely revolutionized the Zelda formula, to the point where Eiji Aonuma is on record saying that whatever the future holds for Zelda, it will include the kind of open-world freedom that the latest entry introduced. The summer kept the momentum going strong with ARMS and Splatoon 2, and despite the latter having one of the most bafflingly backwards online setups known to mankind, those communities are still going strong, supported by constant free updates and events. Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle may have started as a laughing stock, but it seems that the funniest joke here is that it turned out to be an absolutely amazing game, bringing to mind something as deep and complex as XCOM and still managing to improve on that formula with incredibly satisfying movement mechanics. Then Super Mario Odyssey dropped, and everyone got quickly reminded of why this company was and still is a driving force in the industry. All of a sudden, people have decided that the Switch is an incredible console, which is probably why the entire industry is trying to port every game in their catalog to the platform. 
In fact, every company except EA and Bungie were on fire this year from beginning to end. Sega wowed us by hiring longtime Sonic fan game devs to make one of the best games in the series, period. Ninja Theory has definitively put a cork in the argument that good games are too expensive to make with the brilliant Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. Guerrilla Games released Horizon Zero Dawn, an adventure so rich, so feature complete, so satisfying to play, and so packed with meaningful, interesting content that it even gave Zelda a run for its money. But there can be only one game that did it the best, one we hold up as the example that stands above everybody else. And I'm warning you right now, it's not one of the ones you're expecting it to be. Breath of the Wild is amazing, but it has a lot of small annoyances that keep it from being true Game of the Year material. Stamina sucks, weapon durability sucks, not being able to climb in the rain sucks, the Yiga Fortress is one of the worst levels in any video game ever, and I just find it funny that in a game where the best part is solving problems your own way, the dungeons are so unbelievably linear. That just leaves Super Mario Odyssey, which almost took it. But there's one other game that does what Odyssey does much better. In my opinion, Team Pizza's Game of the Year is... A Hat in Time came out just a few months ago, and I already consider it one of my favorites. From the bouncy and colorful art to the liveliness of the cast and the good old fashioned 3D collectathon gameplay, nothing this year or for quite some time before now has done such a good job of making me feel like a kid again. It has my favorite characters this year, it has the most satisfying control scheme this year, it has one of the best soundtracks this year, and that was no mean feat, let me tell you, and it's just plain fun. A Hat in Time is not just a triumph in terms of being an indie game, and not just because it's helped rekindle interest in 3D platformers again, but also because it helps prove that in the right hands, crowdfunding and Kickstarter still work. That it's not just all broken promises and mismanagement. That when it's handled correctly, crowdfunding can provide us some of the best games we've ever played. 2017 has been a heck of a journey for anyone who enjoys this art form, and here's hoping this year, somehow, will be even better. After all, look at what we're opening with. Thank you all very much for watching my year in review. This channel is funded in part by my awesome supporters on Patreon.com slash Team Pizza, as well as my subscribers over on Twitch.tv slash WhatTheFnew. I plan on doing my part to make 2018 the best year it can be, so if you like what you see here and like the promise of things getting even better, give this video a thumbs up, leave a comment, share it around, just engage with it. You have no idea how much it all helps. And please be sure to subscribe and ring that little bell so that you can catch all the awesome as soon as it goes live. Until then, I'm What the Fnew. Later, everybody!